Hey, hello and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here, coming to you live from Honolulu on another beautiful Friday in Honolulu. Thanks for joining us here at Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. And uh, our show's going to be a little bit different today. Not that all my shows aren't a little bit different, but today we're going we're gonna to focus on hydrogen. Go figure, like my favorite subject. But we're going to talk about it in a little bit different terms, because one of the things that that struck me recently is that everybody's in a hurry. Everybody's in a hurry for climate change. Everybody's, we seem to react to crisis. And I spent probably 40 years of my life doing crisis management. And I can tell you that we're really good at it, but it's a lousy way to do business. And what we really should be doing is critical analysis and critical thinking and good, solid planning. And so when people ask me, how come hydrogen isn't already ubiquitous? How come we're not all driving hydrogen cars already? How come we don't have hydrogen infrastructure? I go, just be patient. It's coming because it's coming faster than most people think. But it's not going to hit you right in the face where you see it. and All of a sudden, it's here. You just got to take your time and plan. And the example I like to use is, you know, a few years ago, we were all encouraged to be a little bit more frugal with our power and be efficient with our power at home. And one of the things they told us is, we got these compact fluorescent light bulbs, CFLs. They're the greatest thing. They're really efficient. They use a lot less electricity. They last forever, just like the long tubular fluorescent lights. They're great. We got to do it. They were subsidized. The government got involved. People were advertising it. A lot of the green hugger, tree hugger folks were all wrapped around it. They're full of mercury. And we're throwing them in the landfill one after another now, you know, 5, 10, 12 years later. They didn't last. They don't last as long as the long tubular. Uh, fluorescent bulbs. I've, I've run through a bunch of them at my house already, and it's like, they end up in the landfill. And that mercury is back in the water aquifers, and just what we didn't want to have happen. So why didn't we think about that? And some of the greatest, you know, uh, environmental folks in the world were looking at it and encouraging it, along with everybody else, and it's like, why did we do that? Why don't we think through this thing some more? I can tell you that my um, guests and I today have thought a lot about hydrogen. And we talk about it, we've been talking about it for years. And I, we've really come to the conclusion that hydrogen is the right answer. But so we'll weave that into the discussion. But my guest today is Mr. Dave Rolf from the Hawaii Auto Dealers Association, former extraordinary fighter pilot. So we, we talk with our hands a lot, do this <laughs> stuff. I don't wear my watch anymore because it got shot down too many times. But Dave and I uh, have, have really gotten into hydrogen and he uh, did some touring around this week uh, to visit the hydrogen facilities at Surfco. And he had a real busy week uh, coming up to last weekend where he was uh, putting together the Hawaii Auto Dealers um, Hawaii Auto Show with First Hawaiian Bank, right? They sponsored it again. Right. So, Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Stan. And, uh, so, tell us what kept you busy last week with the auto show and what, what struck you as being unique or different about it um, this year. Well, sure. Thanks, Stan. Thanks for having me here. And thanks to Think Tech viewers, too. Uh, this year, the auto show was just an amazing thing, uh, di different than all the other ones we've had in the past. There's 20 of them. Uh, Motor Trend helps to put this show together for us, and they do 20 shows across the country. But uh, our show has the, here in Hawaii, it's the First Hawaiian International Auto Show, uh, sponsored by First Hawaiian Bank. Um, it's unique in that it has the highest density crowd of any of the 20 shows, more people per square foot per hour. So wow. a lot of people come down to see what's being introduced in the automotive sector. Uh, what was fascinating about this year's show uh, was that we had these ride and drives, uh, these test drives of electric vehicles. And so uh, they were out front. We even had an $80,000 iPACE out there from Jaguar. We wow. had Mercedes out there. And so you could come to the auto show and test drive vehicles from the Port Cochere. Uh, also inside, of course, we have that Motor Trend patented carpet. Uh, here's uh, someone looking at the wonderful oh. hydrogen car there that Serpco has put there. Uh, that's the Mirai. And uh, you get to sit in it and kind of ask questions about how it works. And it gives off eight <clears throat> ounces of water. And you learn all these wonderful kind of things, how it'll go 300 miles. Uh, and then we just had all sorts of things there from uh, uh, new vehicles that were brought in, just 2020 vehicles. Uh, some of them didn't have any VIN numbers on, so they have wow. to be crushed afterwards. Yeah. Uh, in other words, because they can't go on the roadways. Mm -hmm. We had uh, the very famed 2020 uh, Jeep Gladiator, of course. Okay. And that was perfect for a why the doors come off, the roof comes back, and it's a truck. And so a uh, huge amount of attention for that. Uh, a lot of 2020 vehicles were on the floor this year because the manufacturers really knew how popular the Hawaii show was, and so they sent those vehicles. And Matson and Pesha agreed to ship in uh, 
pre-production electric vehicles and uh, feature cars. So we just have the best of the best going on here in Honolulu. And, and you mentioned that, and everybody goes, well, yeah, of course they would ship them in. No, well, ship them it's at hard to ship no them charge. In. I mean, you, they ship them well, out for free. Not only that, but if you don't have VIN numbers, and you, oh, it's, it's, it's hard complex. to ship. It's, it's complex. If you've never shipped vehicles between states or off island, if you don't have all the paperwork right, none of those companies will even touch them. They won't move them at all. And so when, and I know from moving our vehicles from the mainland to here right. that don't have VIN numbers or have, or have experimental VIN numbers, it, it's not a small feat. So congratulations. That's a, a great job that you do oh, getting those oh, things in here. Thank you. Yeah, this uh, show was a pure joy, and it was uh, just fun to be part of it. Good. Well, let me see. And then you went to Surfco a little bit, too. Well, I think we can jump into those, those images, too. And, um, so you've, when was the last time you went to Surfco? Before they had the hydrogen station there? Oh, I was there when they dedicated, when they dedicated it, it. Uh -huh. and uh, when Kahu was there to help bless okay. it. And I went back because I'm privileged to be on your show, and I wanted to see how that really works now, because mm -hmm. people can go in there and actually fuel their leased hydrogen cars. I mean, th this is not some existential <coughs> thing that's out there in the future. People own these cars now, right. uh, actually lease them, and the hydrogen is included in their lease. So they phone ahead, and then uh, uh, they have somebody come out and help them uh, us service it right now. So it's really kind of like the old days of the service station. You actually have someone come out and help you yeah. with it. Although eventually people can be able to fuel themselves right there too. It takes about five minutes. But uh, right now with it in this just beginning stages, uh, Servco just takes that phone call from some of the hydrogen owners and uh, they bring their cars in and they fuel them right there. Yeah, most of the stations in California are self-serve. Mm -hmm. So you just come in. It's just like going into any of the local quick stop stations and run your charge card and, and take out the, the dispenser, hook it up. It, it Actually, the high bar dispenser hooks on just like a regular gas nozzle, except it actually latches onto your, right. your car. And what most people don't realize is that actually also talks to your car. It does. It, it has an infrared sensor that, that sends traffic between the car and the station. Interchange. Because what you don't want to do, and it's a lot of people think it's for safety, but it's really more for giving you a, a quality fill. Mm -hmm. is it monitors the temperature of the tank on the car to make sure it's not overheating. Because if you put in hot gas in the tank and they drive away 20 minutes later and it cools down, you don't have a full tank anymore. So mm -hmm. because we're, we're dealing with a gas, a compressible gas, not a non-compressible liquid like gasoline or, or water or anything. So you can't just pour a gallon of it. You have to keep it at a constant or a real close to a constant temperature. So those stations talk to the car and keep the, the temperature of the gas pretty constant. So there's that aspect to it, but there's also a safety aspect because if you keep heating the tank up and cooling it and heating it up and cooling it, it's just like an airplane that we used to fly where mm -hmm. it's pressurized, depressurized, pressurized, depressurized. With temperature also, it, it starts to break down the structure of the tank and it, it, it decreases the lifespan of the tank. So for safety, it's good to keep the temperature constant too as you're, as you're filling. And then, of course, as you're taking fuel out of the tank into the fuel cell, it's cooling. Mm -hmm. So you can actually get really cool. I'm not sure if they've gotten sophisticated enough where they can actually run air conditioning off of the tank when it's cooling, but that'd be a neat thing to Well, to they check cool out. that down to minus 45 degrees centigrade yeah. to put it in the car. Yeah. Uh, that's because it expands <coughs> a little bit as it goes mm -hmm. in, and that expansion causes some heat. And so I learned about all that. Uh, they took me through Thor. Uh, uh, Toma took took me through the whole process, mm -hmm. and uh, it was like walking the inside of a clock. There were so many parts and so many valves actually in there, all activated. You you know you you start with the water and you distill the water because yep. you're going to pull the hydrogen out of water through an electrolysis process, and then there's another machine that that actually does that. So you distill, then you have the electrolysis, and then you uh, compress, and Your then tanks. you cool, and then you dispense, yep. and so. All this is going on in that wonderful facility of theirs. Yeah. It, it's a magnificent thing to go through. No, you've got and, it and down. And you just are in awe looking around, asking about every <coughs> valve and every dial. It's like being, uh, well, I think you'd mentioned uh, seeing in, in the inside of a cockpit of an airplane, you see all these dials and, and things that uh, you know, make the thing work. It all makes sense. It's, More it's, monitoring. You've actually it? given the process really accurately because the last thing you do is chill it down mm -hmm. so that when it goes in and it heats up, it, it averages out at a good temperature. So they pre-chill it as they're putting it in the car, and that's what keeps the well, temperature. Well, they even let standard. me do it. It was that simple. They mm -hmm. just explained to uh, press that button, and you know, you just take the nozzle off, and, and there, you're right. You just connect it there, and it's talking to the car, and the car talks back, and 
fills up, and five minutes later, you're ready to drive off yeah. silently, I might add. It, you know, it's an yeah, electric it's, car, it's so fun. there's no sound. And so simple a fighter pilot can do it. Yeah, I could even figure it out with just minimal instruction. I could, I could fly that nozzle. Yeah. That's right. So, so the Toyota uses high bar, 700 um, bar pressure, which is 10,000. 750 millibar, uh, yeah. 10,000 PSI. PSI. Somebody mentioned that 750 millibar is 750 atmospheres, so it's high pressure. It's high pressure. As opposed to your tire, when you fill your tire up, that's 33 PSI, yeah. and you're talking about putting 10,000 PSI. And the scuba uh, tank's like 2,500 PSI. Correct. And we're, uh -huh. up, and uh -huh. we're, we're talking 10,000 PSI. 10,000 PSI. And I, I think uh, you have to you press it down, com compress it that much, because otherwise it'd have, the car would have to yeah. be as big as a bus. Uh, yep. It would hold so much hydrogen. That's exactly why. You just have to... Press it, and they, those tanks are so strong with that carbon <coughs> fiber uh, that actually Wraps. surrounds the whole tank. They say you can drop it off the Empire State Building. So, uh, and I believe them. Mm -hmm. I've seen videos of them shooting fifty caliber rounds through it, tracer rounds through it to try and get it to explode and stuff. And it just punctures it. It, it bleeds out the mm -hmm. the uh, the um, hydrogen. No fires, no nothing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. So the the systems are are pretty well. Matured. I mean, most people think that hydrogen technology is pretty new, but even the fuel cell technology, it's, it's improved a lot. But that's technology that's almost 100 years old already, and it's been refined. And Toyota, I have to give them credit, um, and I don't work for them. I don't even have one of their, I've never owned a Toyota, by the way. But they have spent a lot of money on fuel cell vehicles, and they have gotten the technology down to where the fuel cells are like 95% cheaper, um, much smaller. Um, they've, they've just dumped a whole lot of research into developing fuel cells, and they're convinced that they're the future. In fact, what does the word Mirai stand for in Japanese? No, it stands for the, the future. future. The word future. Yeah. Yes, they've, they've kind of pushed all in on hydrogen, and it's fascinating to watch how the Servco people here have invested in that station, and it's a magnificent thing to see in operation. And just, it's so beautiful out there. It's a, it's yeah, a beautiful station. It it's really made so buses could go in there too. That's why it's so right. high. Uh, so it's uh, it also is made uh, to handle uh, forklifts because yep. forklifts are perfect for using using hydrogen fuel cells. Yeah, we're actually trying to purchase some forklifts, and Toyota is one of the companies that makes hydrogen fuel cell forklifts. Mm -hmm. They don't sell them in Hawaii yet, but we're trying to get them to. Mm -hmm. And then um, Yale uh, does hydrogen fuel cell forklifts along with Plug Power, and so we're we're actually getting bids because we're we're a state organizations so we're gonna we're gonna request uh, prices on hydrogen forklifts in the 4,000 pound range mm. and we're gonna put them at the foreign trade zone and let them use them and we'll have one trailer that we can move it out to Hickam when we need it and move it back and forth but um, we're, we're planning you on know, uh, I went back forklifts. to kind of uh, where hydrogen kind of started <laughs> off in the Congress and it started off with our US senator back in the 70s it was Senator Spark Matsunaga, he was the one who helped create the first hydrogen fund, and that's named after him now. He did two other things that he's really known for. He created the Poet Laureate, and he created the Peace Institute. So yeah. you add hydrogen, poetry, and peace, um, it all seems to kind of come together under Spark Matsunaga's yeah. great vision. And it was a Hawaii senator who put that all together. Uh, and now that we have all this research and development happening here, and we have that bill that you and I talked a little bit about that HB 624 that restructures some of government to put everything on the table together so we don't have all these investments in different silos. Maybe we'll be able to move forward with research and development and make this the perfect place to come and do all that. Research development and commercialization. I want to see it right. all happen. Right. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in 60 seconds to spend some more time with Dave Rolf and maybe grasp the bigger picture of Hawaii's future, especially the future in hydrogen transportation. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Yukari Kunisue, the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Japanese talk show on ThinkTech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show. 
and is streamed live on ThinkTech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. Hey, Aloha, welcome back to Santa Energy Man. On my lunch hour, as usual, can't be charging the state money when I'm here doing this show for free. So uh, thanks for coming back and joining us with um, Dave Rolf from the Hawaii Auto Dealers Association, fresh off a really successful um, Hawaii auto show. And um, that, was a, that was a good show. I always enjoy going to the auto show, even though I am just bought a new car, so I don't plan on buying a new one for a couple more years. But uh, it's always well, great. We, we sure appreciate all the manufacturers sending in all those new vehicles. But I, this year I especially appreciate uh, the, the sponsors of the test drives, and that was mm -hmm. ECO and Ulupono Initiative sponsored those wonderful t uh, test drives out front and 400, uh, pardon me, 394, almost 400 people uh, signed up and, and the lines were short. It was handled wonderfully and uh, they took that ride, made right hand turns right all the way around <laughs> the center and got back and uh, the, you see them leave silently. It was yeah. kind of like a carrier launch and a carrier recovery. It was just a lot of activity, a lot of moving parts. Yeah, you know, and people, you know, they think that like on a conventional internal combustion engines, that throaty sound with a nice, uh, a, a nice muffler job on your truck or whatever sounds so cool and everything. But I'm telling you that unless you jump in an electric car and stomp on it, you have no idea what acceleration is. I don't know, a, very few, unless you're at the real top end Ferrari and things like that, cars, can you jump in and get the kind of acceleration you can out of an electric car. And that's hydrogen fuel cell or battery plug-in. Right. It doesn't matter. You get instant torque to the wheels and you're going. It's like a cat shot. I, yeah. You remember as a little kid with your electric train set, if you threw it all the way over to the right, you can, you know, it'll just you take off, off the like track. rocket. Yeah, yeah. Off, off the track. Yeah. So it uh, comes, uh, comes fast. You've got to get used to that a little bit when you start, yeah. actually. But they're, they're good vehicles. And, you know, I'm, I'm a all of the above kind of guy. I, I love hydrogen vehicles, but we need the electric uh, vehicles in no matter what form, whether they're... Um, hybrid gas electrics, whether they're plug-in electrics, whether they're hydrogen fuel cell electrics. Um, I, I like all of them. And I think we should try and adopt them as quickly as we can. But um, one thing you just, you talked a little bit about the station at Surfco. And the one thing that I, I mentioned during the break when I was talking to you is that most people don't realize though that that whole footprint, as complex as it looks, is like the size of about a regular gas station. It's, it's maybe, 2,000 square feet or something total. Well, yeah, the, the whole in, thing. Including the uh, outside all part. The, of the, all the production and the everything. The production station is only about as big as your living room. Right. And it, as opposed to an oil well in the ground and a giant refinery behind it, you, they're actually well, making the hydrogen yeah. right there. So when you drive up to that Surfco station in Mapuna Puna, you're looking at the oil field, the oil pipeline, the oil tanker that it took to get it to the refinery, the oil refinery, and the truck that delivered the gasoline to the gas station all in the footprint of a house. About the size and, of your living room. And yeah, and the real manufacturing piece is about the size of your living room. Mm -hmm. um, and it's using all clean energy from mm -hmm. solar. Surfco uses mostly solar from the but roof that, that's to run coming, that thing. But uh, right they, now they're yeah, on the grid to do they're, it. They're using oh. a lot of grid power right now, but their plans are to make it all solar. All solar. And they do have a lot of solar on that facility, and they do use the solar uh, to make a lot of the, the hydrogen. But it's all carbon free if you can make it from solar or wind or any other renewable. You have carbon free fuel that you're making on site with water and DC power, period. You don't need to ship anything. There's no shipping costs. There's no safety issues. There's no environmental hazard issues. You don't have oil spills in the ocean, things like that. So in Hawaii, as conscious as we are of cost and everything, you know, hydrogen fits the bill. It, you know, if we could start manufacturing our own hydrogen from curtailed power, you know, that's kind of the future. You know, it's a future where we're headed, and, and that's why I'm so bullish on hydrogen. Well, that particular station illustrates how uh, the dollar that you put in there circulates and stays here in the islands, right. and it circulates back through the rest of the economy and then back, and that's the lovely thing. It doesn't go off island, and I, I was most impressed by that. And, when Thor explained, too, that uh, just understanding all that clockwork that's in there uh, takes quite a bit of education and background. So it's a really well-paying job to be able to be one of the engineers back there helping with all that. Uh, and uh, 
uh, absolutely fascinating. Let's bring up uh, one of the other images that, that you said you brought with us today. Um, we've got the Rosetta Stone, we call it first, I think. And that's, uh, oh, there you go, that's not the Rosetta Stone, but that's. It makes a this, good statement, though. A, that's, this is a good lead into the Rosetta Stone. I mean, right. we're, we're talking about, um, we're talking about the uh, vehicles becoming um, more part of the grid than, you know, we, we look at energy currently as gasoline, diesel, and electricity as separate mm -hmm. entities. But we're morphing towards that all electric. And I would say even in 20 to 25 years, a lot of the aircraft are going to be also electric. Um, they may not travel quite as fast, but that may be the penalty that we pay for making sure we're cleaner um, and more efficient and maybe even more economical. Um, not, not to digress from your, your um, image, but I sent you some videos uh, from a, a PhD. I watched, that, uh, this yeah. uh -huh. And the one thing that the takeaway from that video that really got my attention was we've been sucking free energy out of the ground. It's not free because we have to build the infrastructure to pull it out of the ground. But we didn't make that oil. Nature made that oil over millions of years with tons of energy and tons of pressure to get it to where it's at. And now we're refining it, and we're lighting a match to it and burning it in our cars and things like that. But that we're going to start running out of that energy over the next 100 years, um, especially as our energy needs grow, and they are growing. I mean, the industrial age of man has only been the last hundred or so years. And if you look at the use of energy as a whole, you go from almost flat to a spike that's like 20 times higher. And we're going to run out of that free oil pretty soon. And it's going to be hard to get shale oil. It's going to be you know, hard to get natural gas. It's going to be expensive. And just yesterday, Saudi Arabians cut back the production on their uh, oil, on their big oil fields, because they're saying, you yeah, know, we kind of need to stretch this out. There's not as much there as we thought. So the idea of kind of running through all that oil really quickly because it's cheap and it's, it's easy, it's getting harder to get to, it's, it's not going to be cheap anymore. So as we transition to this more electric economy, how are we going to balance the cost of energy? It's certainly if we just try and jump in all at once, it's going to kill us. We're going to try and change the infrastructure overnight. So there's, there's got to be a route to it. There's got to be a growth to it. And I think that's where you're... Rosetta Stone um, graphic really kind of tells the story. That Rosetta Stone, we call it that because uh, in 1799, Napoleon's troops uh, and near the town of Rosetta came across a stone that had hieroglyphic, Doptic, and Greek on it. And by using the Greek and Doptic, they could understand hieroglyphic. Because now we can see the adoption of vehicles all the way out to 2045 and how many are going to be electric, and we think how many are going to be hydrogen, and how many are going to be connected autonomous vehicles, because we can have a fairly good idea of that, so far the graphic has been just spot on over the last eight years. And I likely will follow that uh, very closely all the way out through the next 25. If that's the uh, something we could plan on, and Matson looks at that to plan when they have to replace their ships, and the dealers look at that as to how many uh, technicians they need to have on board. And mm -hmm. uh, the, actually, the state government looks at it to see how much tax revenue is going to be coming exactly. in. So uh, a lot of people are using that graphic uh, to make plans. And so we found that you can factor just about everything from that graphic. Yeah. Let's put um, that graphic up, by the way. So you, you, you can factor how many electric charging stations we'll need in the future. And... You can factor how many hydrogen fueling stations we're going to need in the future. You can factor how many 5G, well, we know that uh, the 5G towers are going in out there in Honolulu. We have mm -hmm. 40,000 light poles and utility poles, and about 10,000 will have 5G towers that will help control the autonomous vehicles. It helps us see how many high-rise buildings need to go in to handle our housing needs. You know, we have 65,000 homes we need uh, backed up right now. and so. I can plan on this graphic where they go, how they go, when they need to go in. You can see that tourism and conventions and military still needs to hold the base. And because this was going to be so hard, we used uh, Euler's identity to prove joy because it's going to be really hard to do all this. Mm -hmm. But uh, eight years ago, I predicted that the first hydrogen car would be in Hawaii on Pi Day, which is 3.1415, March 14, 2015. 2015. And because I helped uh, put on the auto show, I could kind of help know when the show was going to be that year. So 
it turned out we predicted the arrival of the hydrogen car to the yeah. hour. Yeah. Uh, and so, I was there. Uh, <laughs> I know. So Servco put their Mirai on the floor. And I, I was just so tickled that we had predicted eight years ago that it would happen on Pi Day. We have made all these predictions about when these cars are going to come and that the internal combustion engine will be here as they modify that. Uh, and uh, it gets more miles per gallon mm -hmm. and all the new attributes these cars have. But uh, you'll have internal combustion with us for quite a few years. It's not going to stop in right. 2030, as, as uh, some people have kind of indicated. There was a professor who thought that uh, after 2030, it would, it would just be all renewable fuel. But the transition will take quite a bit longer. Uh, just because of the economic aspect of the whole thing. And, and that's the kind of the, the theme that we're talking about, you know, that I started off talking about. And that is, you, need, you have to kind of really look, look ahead and take a lot of things into account. Um, jobs, uh, you can't just change career fields overnight. Some jobs are transportable. You can, you can move and go to a different right. city, and some aren't. Mm -hmm. um, farmers have a hard time picking up 10,000 acres and moving it to another state and do farming. So, you know, but, but certain industries, you, you can move manufacturing around, you can do things, but it still takes time. You don't set up a factory in six months. You set up a factory in a couple of years. You have to get the tooling, you have to get the robotics in, you have to get the workforce trained. Mm -hmm. You know, so to, to sit there and try and change things overnight or to try and force legislation that says we're gonna have all electric vehicles by 2025, it's like, why do that? Why, why try and push everybody so fast when all you're going to do is create a lot of problems. Well, that's why we've enjoyed working with people we call hyphenated with us in a way. Uh, <clears throat> it's had a hyphen HECO, uh, and we'd worked with them on that test drive. Same way with had a hyphen Ulupono, I think, at, at this last week is wonderful. We work so closely with the Hawaii Association of Broadcasters, we feel like we're hyphenated with them. Uh, one time I, I, I needed some uh, help to get the message out that in 2009 uh, that, um, you know, we, we could get the tax credit uh, for the DET and my association of broadcasters knew I needed to get that out, so uh, they helped me produce that commercial and had it on the air that day and we were able to tell everybody something that fast. So uh, it's wonderful to have a small trade association of 30 individuals uh, whose names are on the buildings and they've had it in their families for many generations, many of them have. Uh, this is a group of individuals who have a deep care about their community and their neighbors and so it's uh, wonderful to see how they're taking a leadership role and solving a lot of these problems. And I think we're going to see a lot more electric vehicles on the road, and we're going to see a transition in our grid as well. And I'm patient. I'm waiting for that to all happen. Um, I'm, I'm as anxious as anybody to see it happen as fast as we can, but I'm not impatient. And I think everybody needs to just take a deep breath and look at the big picture and make sure we're doing it right. We could put a 1,000 people to work today and have them all unemployed tomorrow if we don't do it right. We need to make sure everything, the jobs and everything fit together and, and it all flows. But believe it or not, Dave, that's hit us 30 minute point here on the show and uh, I thank you for being here Such again. Such a pleasure to be here. And thank I, you, Stan. And we'll have a chance Thanks to talk to you again. We'll have, we'll have you here before the next auto show so you can give us a preview instead of a post view. Of sure, our game love to do that. So thanks for joining us here at uh, Think Tech Hawaii and Stan Energy Man this Friday. We'll see you next Friday. Aloha.